The Democracy That Delivers podcast is brought to you today by the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center at SIPE. This is the podcast where we talk about corruption in its many forms. And now to your host. Welcome, dear listeners, and thank you for joining SIPE's podcast, Democracy That Delivers. Uh, I'll remind that SIPE stands for the Center for International Private Enterprise, and my name is Katya Lasova. I am SIPE's Program Director for Europe and Eurasia, and I'm responsible for business integrity and anti-corruption compliance programming in Europe and Eurasia region. I'm joined today by my colleague, Sofia Sapigura, uh, who is the Senior Humanitarian Aid and Anti-Corruption Expert located in Kiev, Ukraine. Hi, Sofia. Hello for everyone. Uh, and Sophia and I are delighted to host today our guest, uh, Elizabeth David Barrett, who is Professor of Governance and Integrity and Director of the Center for the Study of Corruption at the University of Sussex. Welcome, Liz. Uh, it's great to have you with us today. Hi, Katya. Hi, Sophia. It's great to be here. The reason we invited uh, Professor David Barrett for a conversation today is that last month, Columbia University Press published the Dictionary of Corruption. And our guest, Lise, is one of the editors of the Dictionary, and we wanted to speak with her about this publication. Uh, let me ask the first question. Lise, given that, uh, you know, discussion of corruption have been at the center of public debate for decades since the adoption of the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act back in 1977 and adoption of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption exactly 20 years ago. So why did you decide to produce this dictionary at this point of time? In other words, what has triggered your work on this dictionary? Sure. Well, I think the, the very simple answer is that we found a need for it in our teaching. So we have two master's programs on corruption and governance at Sussex, and we found that we often needed to define these key terms um, with the students, uh, with the master's students as they were learning. But I think the sort of broader answer, too, is that, as you said, the field has been around for a long time. It's become quite mature now. There are many, many people working in the field and in quite different aspects of the field. So we see that people have specialized in, in different areas of anti-corruption, sometimes relating to private sector, public sector, civil society. There are lots of different anti-corruption tools that we use now and techniques. And actually, that means that the field has become quite complex. And so even if you're an anti-corruption specialist in one particular area, it doesn't mean that you necessarily know about all of those other areas. And that's why we thought a dictionary might be something that would be pretty useful um, to both practitioners and students and scholars of corruption. Well, then, um, given that, again, there is so much conversation about corruption from so many different angles, what was the exact methodology employed when creating this dictionary? In other words, what was the definition of corruption that you used in your study? And how did you determine what corruption terms to, to include or not to include in this dictionary? Well, I'm glad you've asked that. Uh, of course, the definition of corruption itself is a pretty key thing when you're writing a dictionary of corruption. And we do, in fact, have an entry for corruption. Um, the entry is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain, which harms the public interest, typically breaching laws, regulations and or integrity standards. So that's essentially that's adapted from uh, Joseph Nye's definition going back to the 60s and also very similar to the Transparency International definition. Um, but we spent quite a lot of time at the centre in Sussex um, working on that definition and thinking about how to make sure it can really be applied in practice. So in fact, in some of our other work, and we have a, a working paper specifically on the definition of corruption, we sort of go into fleshing out all of those different aspects in a lot more detail. So what do we mean by entrusted power? For example, it's not just public sector, it could also be private sector. What do we mean by an abuse of that power? Does it have to be illegal is a big question there. Um, what do we mean by private gain? Does it have to be going into the pocket of an individual or could it benefit a party or another group? And what do we mean by harm to the public interest? Is that always sort of direct and, and visible? Can it also be indirect in terms of undermining rule of law and that kind of thing? 
So that is our overarching definition of corruption. And everything should really fit within that in some respect, um, in terms of elaborating on that or being a particular type of uh, corruption on that basis, or being an anti-corruption tool um, within that. Um, I think the second part of your question then was about methodology. Yes. Um, so, of course, there's then lots and lots of terms. So we we brainstormed among ourselves, the faculty um, at the Center for the Study of Corruption. Uh, we So we came up with a, a working list initially, and we sort of passed that around and asked people for suggestions about um, what we'd missed. Then when we identified the authors, because the, the book has about 63 um, contributing authors, so we tried to go to the people who we thought were the big experts on that particular aspect. And we also asked them, you know, do you, what do you think of our list? Do you think we've missed anything? Um, so there was a, an opportunity for them to contribute there to sort of what was covered and not covered. Um, having said that, we were constantly in the last few weeks coming up with, oh, my God, we've forgotten this. Um, and I think still when we look at it today, we see that there are things that should be in there that are missing. So um, it's an it's an ongoing process, I think. Excellent. And before I pass on to uh, um, our co-host, uh, Sophia, so let me just ask one question about, you know, the, the, this range of definitions. Um to what extent does the dictionary capture these different types of corruption? Uh, again, there is a more the better realization among the, the general public that it's not just the petty type of administrative type of corruption, but it's more harm, harmful types of, you know, uh, grant, uh, state capture mm -hmm. type of corruption, right? So which is not your typical bribery. Um, and, uh, you know, USAID is using the terms of transnational strategic corruption in their anti-corruption uh, strategy and policies. So to what extent does the dictionary capture the range of those definitions? Yeah, quite a lot. In fact, I think that for me, that was one of the interesting things in kind of reflecting on, on what's in there. Um, I think if we had done this 10 years ago or possibly even five years ago, you would have seen much less of that because we were, as a community, I think much less cognizant of you know, those how important those parts of corruption are. Um, we were not really considering still the security threat posed by corruption. We were not really considering the, the transnational nature so much. And now so many of the entries in the dictionary do in fact relate to that. And I think that's also useful because those are still fairly new terms. So, for example, we've got corrosive capital in there, which um, is, of course, a term coined by SIP, um, which has been a big contribution to the field in terms of thinking about how states might um, invest in other countries in non-transparent ways, ways that break the rules and um, which are not really market oriented, but have some kind of political objective. Um, so that, for example, is one there. But we've also got lots of we've got a piece on state capture, um, elaborating on that, piece on grand corruption, um, lots of the kind of uh, transnational aspects of illicit financial flows, anti-money laundering, what is an enabler um, of that kind of corruption. Um, so all those terms uh, are, are in there and, um, well, apart from the ones that we've inevitably forgotten. Well, thank you so much for uh, mentioning the corrosive capital uh, um, definition, right, that SAIP has worked in, in the last several years. So thank you so much. Uh, just one little question kind of the, the, in, in the follow up. So when we talk about all these definitions, to what extent does the dictionary go into the anti-corruption, not just corruption, but anti-corruption actually action? So what can be done to combat those types of corruption? Well, um, lots of anti-corruption tools and techniques are defined uh, in the dictionary. I would say, you know, it's not a manual. So it's not so much that, you know, if you see a type of corruption next to it, there's a kind of, and here's what you can do about it. Um, so it's not so much linked in that way. Having said that, you know, you will find that there are, you know, some links made um, where, you know, where there's a clear sense. So, you know, some of the entries on anti-bribery laws, for example, will then refer you to compliance programs or or to deferred prosecution agreements. So they'll, they'll make the links. And what we've done uh, is we've bolded any terms 
Um, so in the general description of a term, we've bolded any terms that are defined elsewhere in the dictionary. So that enables you in a way to sort of cross-reference other bits. It's almost like, I remember when I was a kid, we had these choose your own adventure books. I think you can sort of use it in that way. You can um, get inspired in one definition to go and look up something else um, and it will take you on a journey through the book. Excellent. And actually, in the follow up in terms of the usage of the dictionary, let me turn uh, over to uh, Sophia. And because I know she has a couple of questions about that. Sophia, over to you. Well, you see, it sounds like the dictionary covers a pretty wide range of definitions and it's impressive. Thank you for that. Uh, but getting back to the definition of corruption, you mentioned uh, integrity standards. And, uh, you know, from the Ukrainian perspective, uh, uh, there seems to be a perception that the Ukrainians um, tend to use integrity when it comes to anti-corruption. Uh, as you said, I understand that it's not a tool or guide for anti-corruption, but it's just dictionary. But my question would be how or whether the dictionary defines integrity. Yeah. You know, in Ukraine, um, there seems to be a perception that each act, every instance of injustice is called corruption. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid. And uh, people, ordinary people, just operate with these terms integrity, integrity standard, and justice, injustice. Whether I'm wondering whether it is defined as a separate different term. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, integrity. Yeah. We have a separate en uh, entry for integrity. So it's defined as a quality of honesty and ethicality possessed by an individual or organization, frequently contrasted with corruption. Um, and of course, the term that it can also mean whole or undivided. And the, actually, we put integrity in there. We also think it's very, very important. Um, I quite like it as a term because it's a more positive way. So it's sort of rather than focusing on the bad, it it focuses on the behaviours that we want to encourage. Um, but it also, of course, makes a link with the fact that, you know, if you've got individuals and organisations acting with integrity, they're likely to be more resilient against corruption. So, again, it sort of focuses a bit more on that preventive side, which I think is really important. It also encourages us to go beyond the legal and the illegal. So I think actually what we want and you know, one of the problems we often face in fighting corruption is that, of course, you introduce some new technique. And then you find that the corrupt actors have changed their practices and they just shift to another area. So it can feel like this losing battle. Some people talk about playing a game of whack-a-mole or you, know, you squeeze the toothpaste tube here and it pops up over there. Um, and that is, of course, a big problem. And, and that's another reason why I think that it's useful to talk about integrity, because if you're constantly chasing and trying to come up with new anti-corruption tools, you are fighting a losing battle. Whereas if you're trying to build up people who actually think beyond just, can I get away with this? Or even maybe think beyond, is this illegal? But they think, is this the right thing to do? Is this the responsible thing? Is this the thing that is going to further the public interest? That is in line with the sort of rules and standards expected of someone in my position of entrusted power? Then actually you're going to have a much more um, long-term sustainable approach to anti-corruption. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And getting back to usage, as God has said, uh, you mentioned that the dictionary is uh, focused on either students or anti-corruption practitioners. Well, I want to uh, I want to raise one concern: uh, whether it can be applicable at different national levels. You know. Um, I presume that it generalizes all the legal terms that are used globally, uh, terms that are applicable when it comes to international treaties and anti-corruption sphere, but countries differ, yeah. their political regimes differ, people's moral compass, as you said, right? Moral compasses are different and the level of understanding what corruption is defined in international 
treaties is absolutely different. So my question would be whether, what do you, uh, what do you think, whether it can be applicable uh, at national levels very easily and, uh, you know, um, in general. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. Um, so we do, so where there is something like an international convention or treaty, we, of course, um, you know, use the terms that are defined in that and we explain what the, the convention um, is. Um, we also look at some big laws, which, although they are national laws, they have a more extraterritorial reach. So, for example, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, the UK Bribery Act, and we'll explain there what the kind of jurisdiction coverage is. But when it comes to looking at the the legal framework, you will always need to look at the national legal framework to really understand what is outlawed as a corrupt practice and what is not, and also what the enforcement um, practices are, what's really enforceable. So, um, so it, there is a limitation there in terms of looking at what's illegal. But having said that, I think there are also quite a lot of concepts which are not legally defined, um, but which are nonetheless relevant to how we think about corruption. So I'm just flicking through cronyism, for example, preferential treatment of friends and close associates or their relations by those in positions of power. So, you know, that's something which is a broader concept. There might well be legal offences in particular countries that relate to that. But the overall concept is, I think, a broader one where it's useful to have a sense of, you know, how is that being defined? What are the um, the uh, parameters of that? Nudge theory is another one. What's nudge theory? And actually, that just brings me on to, you know, when you think about something like nudge theory, so the theory that simple, low-cost interventions can be used to shape the decisions of citizens. Of course, that's something that is used to try and alter behavior, not just in the area of corruption, but in lots of areas. So what we've done with something like that is we've specifically tried to make the link with anti-corruption. So we're not defining um, you know, all the possible uses of nudge theory, but we are talking about how, how it interacts with corruption. And same with kind of some big institutions. So if you look at the World Bank, for example, we, you know, we'll tell you what the World Bank is, but we really focus in quite quickly on what the World Bank does on corruption um, interventions. So we're not sort of looking at all the rest of the World Bank's work in there. Well, it sounds like this dictionary can be very useful and applicable not only for developed countries with solid anti-corruption um, structures, but also for developing countries who are just uh, constructing their systems for fight against corruption. I would hope so. And... <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so for example, you can look up public procurement and then you can sort of, you know, go and look at yeah, open contracting and all the things that people might do around trying to fight corruption in public procurement. So I, I hope that would be useful um, more broadly. Well, this is great. Uh, Liz, you mentioned, uh, you know, the nudge theory, right? So and so it's great that the, the social norm approach to corruption that's really the captured in the dictionary seems to be because that's what the, you know, the current vision for uh, anti, for effective anti-corruption measures um, uh, is. And um, let me just ask you one question uh, about the private sector and to what extent that the role of the private sector uh, has been captured in the dictionary in terms of uh, you know, private sector corruption, but also the private sector being an actor in combating corruption, right? As we see the increasing growing role of the private sector in monitoring um, and, you know, um, being more aware and um, uh, about the, the, their accountability role over certain expenses and public procurement um, you know, contracts and, and so on. So, yeah, so uh, in, in terms of private sector, what can the business community learn about corruption from your dictionary and effective ways to tackle the problem? Sure. Yeah. So we have, for example, we have an entry on business integrity. Um, again, something that SIP is working a lot on in different parts of the world. Um, we have an, an entry on collective action, which, of course, is not just open to the private sector, but often the private sector is very involved. Um, we have entries about particular initiatives um, where the private sector gets involved. So the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, um, for example. Um, so quite, a, I think, a number of different um, sorts of initiatives there. 
Um, we also, of course, have entries on compliance. Um, so the more sort of more formal organisational responses, um, entries on the, the the bribery laws, as I mentioned, but also, you know, one thing you come across if you, you look at the risk of um, anti-bribery enforcement actions is deferred prosecution agreement. So, you know, we define that and explain to people um, what they are and how they work. Um, another area I'd bring up, we have an entry on the revolving door. So the practice of people moving between public sector and private sector roles and how that might create conflicts of interest. So I think that's the kind of thing that is a, a sort of concrete corruption problem that businesses often have to deal with and need to put in place systems to tackle. Um, and that also brings me on to case studies. So one of the other things we have in the book is quite a few case studies. And here we took what we saw was really defining cases and of corruption. And we've just given a kind of 750 word description of those cases. And we hope that people learn quite a lot from those too, because you sort of see, you know, what was this scandal, what happened, who who was in the wrong, who abused their entrusted power, um, what was the harm done? Uh, you know, how did it come to light, potentially? What can be done about it? Um, so all of the case studies, I think, um, are also quite useful. For example, there's one on the revolving door. So one of the big um, cases um, where um, someone, uh, Dorleen Druyun, had moved from a, um, a role in the Department of Defence and then um, gone to work for one of the um, big aerospace companies that she had previously been dealing with through that role. So there's um, that case is explained. So um, so I think there's sort of quite a number of different ways in which businesses can see what risks other companies have faced, how they've dealt with them. Sometimes it's gone right, sometimes it's gone wrong. Um, and also thinking about these sort of responses, both in terms of more formal um, compliance responses, but also the the really positive business integrity, collective action kinds of work. Excellent, excellent. I think case studies are is, is one of the most, of course, useful and helpful ways uh, of learning as uh, in Saib's experience uh, with working with the private sector stakeholders around the world. So, and as you mentioned, several examples of revolving door and other type of uh, corruption involving private sector. So what about the political finance and lobbying? That's been discussed a lot on the OECD level as they are now adopting the new the recommendations and things like that. So to what extent that has been addressed in the, in the corruption? Oh, sorry, in the dictionary on corruption. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so lobbying also has quite a long entry and again, sort of, you know, trying to spell out the difference between good lobbying, the kind of lobbying that we want, where it helps to sort of improve on a law um, and make sure it works um, better in the public interest, but also when lobbying can become improper influence and can um, lead into corruption. You also asked about political financing, so we have a an entry on that, political financing and pu political party funding. And then, of course, that refers to other important things in that area. So the Citizens United judgment, for example, um, that has its own entry. Um, we talk about some of the civil society organisations that are doing good work in this area around party financing and trying to regulate that. So, yeah, I think you, you can learn quite a lot by sort of you know, reading around and, and following uh, between entries. Excellent, excellent. And before I turn on uh, to, uh, to Sophia for, for her <laughs> maybe follow-up questions, let me just ask you, uh, you mentioned briefly that since the publication, so it's what it's been a month or just over a month and that you are thinking that, you know, maybe some terms could have been included. So I was just wondering what response have you received so far to the dictionary? Yeah, from the public. And uh, what would be a couple of the terms that you think uh, would be a good idea to actually include it maybe in the revised edition of the dictionary? Yeah, um, so we've had a... Um... Really positive response, actually. I've been um, quite pleasantly surprised. It seems there was a need for this. So a lot of people are saying, oh, this is just, you know, really useful thing to have as a kind of reference um, document. And you know, not that it will always be definitive. So I'm sure there will be some definitions where people will 
you know, disagree with how we've defined it, um, but we do hope that it's a kind of a starting point. And also many of the entries also have suggestions for further reading so that you can go off and, and read more about this. Um, so, um, so the response has been pretty positive. In terms of things that we missed out, actually one that we noticed, of course, is so we'd included Sipe's concept of corrosive capital. And then, of course, when I was flicking through the other day, I realised that we hadn't included the, the kind of counter to that. So the constructive capital. So that's something um, that is missing that would be in the next um, version. Um, I think you know, it's also interesting to think about what new techniques and tools might have been developed by then. So perhaps there are things now which are really just nascent budding tools, which within a few years time we'll think, oh, that's an absolutely core um, thing that we are using. Of course, the US has introduced a, a new law um, the FEPA um, since we published the dictionary. So that is now missing. Um, so this is a fast changing field. And um, and I think, yeah, we will be keeping a track. If people have ideas for the things that we've missed out, um, then please do send them in. And actually that reminds me of something I was going to say in response to Sophia's earlier question about the sort of national practices. So one thing we kept coming across is that different countries have got different terms for various kinds of informal practices and mechanisms. So we have included a number of those, um, but we have we also realised that we could go, you know, that would be a sort of almost unending task. And we would also refer people to Elena Ledeneva's uh, Encyclopedia of Informality, um, which really catalogues all of those different practices and terms for, for informality. So we've got some of them, but there's a, a much bigger resource there. Excellent, excellent. And I just let uh, Sophia, if you have any follow up questions in the remaining time of, uh, of our podcast, uh, go ahead. Uh, well, Liz, you mentioned a new edition, so we are expecting for a new one already, right? And my question would be just very practical where we can buy this dictionary. Um, you can, you should be able to buy it in all major booksellers. Um, you can buy it directly from Columbia University Press. Um, I think there are some distinctions between if you're sitting in North America or if you're outside. So you can also buy it from the UK publisher, which is called Agenda. Um, but we will be including all of this in the show notes, including actually a discount code um, so that would give people um, uh, a slightly cheaper rate. But it is quite reasonably priced, I would say. It's not one of those crazy academic books that costs £70 or $100 or, or whatever. It's it's pretty reasonable. And uh, Liz, given that we have some a little, a little time left on our podcast, I wanted to ask you um, that I see the three names of the main editors of this dictionary and again, given that the variety of views and approaches to how to define corruption and certain anti-corruption measures, what were the main disagreements, if there were any, among you three and other, as you said, 63 contributing authors to this dictionary? So what would be curious? What, what, was, what, what entries uh, evoked the most of the debates? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so in fact, there are four of us um, editors on this and there were some things that were fairly controversial. Um, so, of course, the definition of corruption itself is something that we've spent a lot of time debating, hours and hours. Um, so some of that you can see in the dictionary, but um, more of that is in the working paper. Um, other issues, the measurement of corruption is always very controversial. It's something that I'd been working on quite a lot in the last year and a half. Um, but we also have, of course, Robert Barrington is one of the editors who used to work for, uh, used to run the UK chapter of Transparency International. And and so he had quite clear views about the Corruption Perceptions Index. And we ended up having quite a um, lively debate on that entry, shall we say. Um, I think he still says that he's not entirely happy with it. Um, so that was quite interesting. Um he also says that he was quite interested to see the definition of petty corruption because he'd been thinking about that only in terms of kind of size of bribe, but not so much in terms of sort of level of office um, of the, the office holder. Um, so, so there were some things that sort of threw up surprises even for you know those of us who've been working on this for absolutely years. So I think it's always quite a 
a fun exercise to try and define things. It sort of it reveals people's assumptions and maybe prejudices, and um, so it's it's quite a good intellectual exercise. Yeah, and given that you've spent uh, some time, you you actually you lead the Center for Study uh, uh, of Corruption at the university. So what do you see, what is the future of anti-corruption actually in the coming years uh, or a decade, yeah, given many other challenges uh, that we observe in the recent years? Yeah, I think um, there are sort of these two aspects to anti-corruption. There's kind of the technical and the political, I think. And I think on the technical side, you know, we have often got quite a lot better um, at developing tools that that really deal with uh, corruption, and so and there's a lot of exciting things happening there um, with new things coming online, the potential of AI, and I've seen, for example, um, you know, Brazil always jumps out to me as a country that is really utilizing some of these tools very cleverly, using them to prioritize where they put anti-corruption resources and I think you know given that this is such a huge task being able to decide well where should we spend the money to be most efficient um, that's that's quite a useful kind of um, outcome of, of using AI so so on the technical side there's interesting stuff happening but I think actually one of the big things is recognizing that anti-corruption is political too so I would hope and I think where we're going is becoming much more aware of that and much more willing to talk about that um, so I hope that I would see more of that in the future um, in terms of recognizing that this you know this is about distribution of um, of power these are quite political questions both where corruption happens and when you want to try and stop it you've got to get involved in in quite political um questions and decisions and recognize that so yeah i think that we're we're appreciating that more now but uh, it's of course a very challenging sensitive difficult um topic so it also makes clear how difficult the problem of of tackling corruption is well, I think this is a very important conclusion uh, and very important kind of finding a consequence of your you know, hard work on this issue of corruption and in producing this uh, a very helpful publication for, as we mentioned, again, it's not just for students, for practitioners, for private sector uh, representatives, for anyone who is interested in the issues of corruption and anti-corruption measures. So um, I just would like to thank you, uh, Professor Elizabeth David Barrett was with us for being with us today. And thank you, Sophia, for co-hosting this podcast and stay safe. Um, all the best to everyone. Enjoy our future episodes uh, on SEPS podcast, Democracy That Delivers. Listen and subscribe to SIPE's Democracy That Delivers, wherever you get your podcasts.